Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. Party. Having just defeated a pack of Slud and therefore saving dwarfs from the Stone Tribe, I headed south following the eruption of Desaria Volcano. The paladin looks at the dwarfs and points to the hill they came down. We have a cart on the other side of that hill, but we can't fit everyone. Duggan nods. No need. We've got our own. He gestures to a parade of carts, two of which have been knocked onto their sides. The paladin looks at them. Ride your carts and we'll follow. The dwarfs agree, and that is exactly what happens. The party fall into line behind the other three carts, following along as they make their way through the ash-covered land of Isopin. As night falls, the carts come to a stop and a camp is set up. The party set up by a fire the dwarfs are huddled around, noticeably making some of the smaller humanoids uncomfortable. Duggan looks at the sorcerer. So, you guys are from the swamp, huh? No man's land. Sorcerer points at the paladin and rogue. No from swamp, he points to himself, the cleric and the fighter from swamp. Fighter nods, his mouth full of meat he carved off the slard. Fleshy die swamp. Swamp lizard folk home. Is good. One of the other dwarfs looks at him and seems disgusted. UHH, should you be eating that? I don't think that's healthy at all. The fighter looks at him. Is good. The dwarf gestures to the fire. At least cook it man. That's probably got more diseases than you can count. The fighter pauses before throwing the meat into the fireplace. It begins to crackle and the skin begins to burn. He grabs his bone javelin and impales the meat, letting it cool off before he bites into it again. It's still raw in the middle, but he doesn't seem to care. Meanwhile, the rogue isn't looking so good. He and the dwarf that was struck by the blue slard are beginning to sweat profusely and the rogue is feeling off. Rogue decides to go to sleep early that night, still no attempt at being healed. The party wake to screams the next morning. The cleric bursts out of his tent to see the camp in chaos. The tent opposite him is split down the middle, and a dwarf is lying back on the ground, eyes staring blankly at the sky as a red slard tears into his stomach with teeth and claws. The slard looks up at the cleric and lets out a horrific screeching roar. The cleric summons the sword, even as the paladin and fighter are climbing out of their tents. The cleric swings at the slard, who ducks out of the way. He catches it on the leg as it backs away and goes to swing again at its head. It darts out of the way and rakes its claws against his chest. The paladin runs in with his axe and slams it into the slard's side before wrenching it out and slamming it into its ribs. The slard hisses at him as it tries to bat him away. The fighter is about to run in when the tent beside him splits open. Another red slard crawls out of the hole, and behind it he can see the body of two dwarfs, one of which still appears to be moving. He turns on it and slashes it across the face with his axe before jamming it into its leg. He expends a superiority die to try trip it, but it holds fast. The sorcerer climbs out of his tent and immediately sights the slard. He raises his hand, striking it with a lightning bolt. Several dwarfs, now awake due to the combat, rush out of their tents, engaging their past friends. A slard rakes its claws across the paladin's stomach before rushing forward and sinking its teeth into a dwarf's neck. The dwarf is lifted off the ground and thrashed around before being tossed to the ground gracelessly. He seems alive, but barely. The cleric swings his sword embedding it into the slard's foot before pivoting and firing a guiding bolt at the other slard. The paladin, using the distraction to get behind the slard, swings into its back with advantage. Nat 20. He hits it with a second level smite. The slard roars as the radiant energy surges through it, turning in time to catch the second strike across its face. The other slard rushes the fighter, leaping at him with a roar. He yells out as he slams onto his back. And before he can crawl to his feet, the slard gets on top of him. He holds out his axe, using the shaft to keep the slard's jaws from closing over his throat. However, 
he is unable to stop the slard from raking its claws across his stomach. He bites its shoulder, tearing flesh away before trapping its leg and rolling, getting it onto its back. Now on top, he proceeds to ground and pound the slard with his axe, mushing its already contorted face. The sorcerer grabs his dagger and casts green flame blade, proceeding to slam the dagger into the already downed slard's forehead. It struggles and strains and just refuses to die. The dwarfs break the other slard's kneecap with a war hammer before tearing into its side and back with swords and axes. The cleric raises his sword and buries it in the slard's shoulder over and over. It just won't die. It slashes across a dwarf's chest before swinging at the paladin, who barely deflects the blow. It goes to bite the cleric, only receiving a knee to the face in response. The paladin raises his axe and buries it into the back of its skull, using a first level smite to finally finish it off. The remaining slard bites into the fighter's arm and throws him off, turning on the sorcerer. It slashes at him twice, both of which he barely manages to deflect and dodge. The fighter climbs to his feet and slams his axe into the back of the slard's leg, tripping it. The sorcerer raises his hands and fries it with another lightning bolt. The slard finally goes still. As the party breathe heavy sighs of relief, the fighter looks around. Where Gobby? The party open his tent, seeing him face up, sweat covering his body and blood coating his lips. He raises a hand weakly as the cleric runs over, casting cure wounds on him. The wounds don't close. The rogue holds his hand, squeezing tightly. Don't let me become one of them. The cleric tries to cure wounds him again at 5th level. It doesn't work. We'll make safe. You know die. The rogue lets out a yell and his body begins to convulse violently. The party watch as patches of his skin begin to lighten, becoming red. He stops spasming and looks at the cleric. A tear rolls down his eye. Kill me. Please. I don't want to become one of them. The paladin steps forward. Turks, you're okay. We're going to make you better. He places his hands on the rogue's heaving chest and uses lay on hands. I tell him quietly that the chaos phage has already progressed too far. The paladin understands what I mean. The rogue grabs the cleric's hand. Tell the others I love them, and that I died trying to save them. The cleric nods. You lizard folk. You hunt in Beastland forever. The rogue gives a small smile. That sounds nice. He grits his teeth again as more of his skin begins to turn red. The nails on his hand begin peeling away, being replaced by larger, sickly looking claws. The cleric draws his dagger. Rest now. The rogue nods and closes his eyes. The cleric slams the dagger into his chest, impaling him through the heart. The rogue lets out a choked gasp as the dagger pierces his body, before the faintest smile crosses his face. I'm coming Corley. The rogue goes still. The cleric pulls out a diamond, lifting it to place it on the rogue's motionless chest. The paladin reaches forward and grabs his hand, stopping him. If you bring him back, the disease will come with him. The cleric frowns. He dead. Can bring alive. The paladin shakes his head. Don't do it. We need to clear his body of the disease, otherwise we can't bring him back. The cleric nods and puts the diamond away. He places his hand on the body and casts gentle repose. The cleric turns to the sorcerer and fighter. No eat. Bring back later. They nod in agreement. The paladin goes and grabs his blanket, wrapping it around the rogue's body. It's way too big for the small goblin body, and so can easily wrap around his entire body and face. The paladin scoops up the wrapped body and exits the tent, where he sees the other dwarfs waiting. Dalgan looks at the wrapped body in the paladin's arms and lowers his head, not saying a word. The paladin walks over to the cart and places the rogue inside. He walks back towards Dargan. How far away is Gugaria? 16 days, at a minimum. The paladin frowns. Our friend only has 10 days. We don't know if the disease can be cured by what we have, and we don't want to bring him back to test it. Dargan shakes his head. I don't know what to tell you, it can't be done. The sorcerer suddenly steps forward. Need dwarf get in. Duggan nods. Yeah, but that doesn't change anything. You won't get there in time. 
The sorcerer shakes his head. Can get us there. Only bring two people. He tells the party his plan. The paladin immediately brings up a point. We've split the party. The sorcerer shrugs. Only small while. If save Gobby, this only way. Fighter nods. Paladin and Dargan go. We stay. Protect small fleshy. Meet Gugaria. The party finally agree. Dargan turns to the other dwarfs. Our friends need my help to get to Gugaria. They have saved our lives. I believe it is our duty to try save one of theirs. This plan is dangerous, but I believe it may work. The paladin goes and grabs the rogue, lifting him into his arms. The sorcerer nods and pauses for a moment. Is ready? Both Dargan and the paladin nod. The sorcerer nods again and closes his eyes. He casts polymorph. The party watch as the sorcerer's scales begin to shift to red, and his limbs stretch unnaturally long. His bones break and reform as his features change to fit his new appearance. His tail lengthens and he growls as two large wings burst from his back. The transformation complete, the sorcerer lifts his head and roars, now a young red dragon. The paladin walks over and boosts Dargan onto the sorcerer's back before climbing up himself, rogue in his arms. He looks back at the cleric. Use sending every day. We'll keep in touch. The cleric nods. The sorcerer roars and digs his claws into the ground. He sprints forward, flapping his immense wings, sending the tents whipping in the wind. He takes off, soaring into the sky, headed for Gugaria. The fighter turns to the dwarfs. Look at me. The dwarfs stare at him. I am the captain now. The dwarfs nod slowly. He turns to the cleric. Is it okay if we eat the red fleshies? The cleric pauses. What did, ranger, say? Eating fleshies is fine so long as we all agree on that. The cleric pauses. Also say no eat friend of fleshy. They have a long think about this. Finally the fighter seems to have an idea. Ask small fleshy if red fleshy friend. The cleric nods and turns to the dwarf cleric. He points at one of the slud bodies. Is your friend? The dwarf hesitates. I mean, he was. It was? He is? I don't know. The cleric shrugs. They don't know. The fighter nods. No eat fleshy in case small fleshy attack. The cleric agrees. They proceed to get the dwarfs to pack up before restarting on their route to Gugaria. At the end of each passing day, the cleric uses sending to message the paladin, reporting their safety. The paladin replies by saying where they are and reporting on how the rogue looks. On their fourth day alone, the cleric and fighter are setting up camp, micromanaging their small dwarven force. They dictate lookouts before heading to sleep. Later in the night, the cleric is woken by a dwarf, who, after hearing tales from other people before him, woke the sleeping lizard folk from a distance. The cleric gets up and walks to the designated lookout point, where he meets the dwarven cleric. He sits down on a rock beside him looking at him. The dwarf is looking out into the night, his fingers fiddling with a holy symbol around his neck. The cleric points to it. What hold? The dwarf shrugs. Symbol of my god. He holds it out, showing a hammer. The cleric looks at it before shaking his head. Too small use in battle. The dwarf chuckles. Yeah well, there are other ways to fight wars than with a sword and shield. The cleric shrugs. The dwarf turns to him. You serve any god. Don't you lizard folk have your own deity? The cleric shrugs again. Simuana god of lizard folk. No serve though. The dwarf raises an eyebrow. Oh. Why not? Simuana no protect lizard folk. Survival good, but not enough. The dwarf gets a perplexed look on his face. So who do you serve? The cleric reaches into his leaf bag and pulls out a leaf. Ancient one. He puts the leaf in his mouth and sits there. His eyes narrow as a blast of air hits him, frigid and smelling of decay. No good. The dwarf looks at him. What? The cleric gets to his feet. No right, one group. He turns and freezes, a black bladed sword to his throat. On the other end of the blade is a half orc, garbed in chain mail and armed to the teeth. However, the cleric recognizes him immediately. Tiber. Game ends.
Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. The Sorcerer, now in the form of a young red dragon, soars just below the clouds, the Paladin and Argon on his back. They've traveled the equivalent of 9 days worth of ground travel in the 3 days they've been apart from the fighter and cleric. The sorcerer feels his polymorph fading, so he descends quickly, alighting on a small hill. Duggan and the paladin slide off just in time for the polymorph to fade. The sorcerer looks at Duggan. How close Gugaria? Duggan pulls out a map and looks around them. He points to a large forest. If I'm right, that's Talion Forest. So, at our pace, we should have another 3 days travel ahead of us. The paladin gently places the body of the rogue down and pulls open his bag. Running low on rations. Duggan pulls his out. Me too. Sorcerer points to Talion Forest. Hunt food forest. Duggan immediately shakes his head. I ain't going in there. Faceit lives in there. Paladin frowns. Faceit? Yeah. Supposedly there's a portal to the Fee Wild in there. Whole bunch of weird shit comes and goes through there. The sorcerer shrugs. We'll eat anyway. Duggan pauses. We could find somewhere else. Look for a town or something. Paladin looks down at the rogue. Can't afford to carry him around while we fight off fake creatures. We'll find a town. The sorcerer nods and sits down for a moment, taking a drink of water. He burns all of his first level spell slots to make a new fourth level slot. He polymorphs into the dragon again. The two passengers climb aboard and after a running start, he takes off into the air. They fly for almost an hour, when suddenly, the party hear the echoing wail of horns. The sorcerer looks down, seeing the shape of a city form below him. He begins to descend just as he hears a loud cracking sound. He lets out a roar of surprise as a ballista bolt whizzes past his face soaring into the sky. He turns sharply, almost throwing Duggan and the paladin off his back. Another bolt barely misses his wing, and he begins to glide to the ground in a hurry. When they're about 100 feet in the air, the sorcerer feels a bolt slam into his shoulder. He lets out a paint drawer and his wing can't keep up. He turns, and both passengers let out a yell as they're thrown from his back. The sorcerer, falling at almost maximum speed, forces himself to change back. He turns midair and twins fly, hitting the paladin and Dargan. He barely gets off the spell before he slams into the ground, tumbling several feet before coming to a stop. The fly ends almost immediately, but in the time, the paladin manages to grab the rogue's body. He rolls a dex save. 17. He lets out a yell of pain as he hits the ground, using his brief slowing of momentum to reduce the damage. Dargan and the paladin hit the ground, letting out groans of pain. The paladin, still holding the rogue makes sure he is okay. He uses lay on hands to reset the broken bone of his femur, and slowly climbs to his feet. He walks over to Dargan, who is lying on his back and staring up at the sky. He lets out a pained wheeze. That hurt. The paladin casts cure wounds on him before walking over to the sorcerer. The sorcerer is on his side, bones heavily broken and unmoving. However, the paladin can see that his chest is moving ever so slightly. He uses third level cure wounds on him and picks up the still heavily wounded sorcerer. The sorcerer blinks at him. Is we alive? The paladin nods. Why didn't you take the fall as a dragon? You would have taken the landing easily. The sorcerer shrugs. No think in time. Well, rogue, is okay, and so is Dargan, so we're set to get out of here as soon as you're ready. At that point however, they hear the sound of approaching hoof bits. They look west, where they can see the city on a slightly raised hill, and a cavalry force making their way over to them. The sorcerer groans and slowly climbs to his feet. They shoot me? Dargan runs over, holding the rogue in his arms. Hey, I'd like to get out of here now if you wouldn't mind thanks. The sorcerer shakes his head. Short me. He looks at the approaching force and holds out his hands. The force gets a little closer before he growls. Stupid fleshy no shoot. A fireball erupts from the middle of the group, sending several stumbling and killing others immediately. 
The horses scream in fear as the flames billow in front of them, but the remaining owners direct them away from the blast. The paladin sighs and raises his axe. Guess we're doing this then. However, as opposed to the melee attack they'd been expecting, I ask them to make wisdom saving throws. All of them fail, and the three adventurers let out sounds of shock as their limbs are pinned to their bodies. The person responsible, an elven woman lowers her hand. They're restrained. The other cavalry members approach, several of them in full plate. They step down and kick out the lizard folk's knees, binding their hands behind them with manacles. The sorcerer growls as his magic is leeched away from him. Their weapons are taken off of them. Dalgan's eyes flick over to the sorcerer in a seriously, man, sort of look. One of the knights raises the mask of his helm and peers down at the group. Where's the dragon? He looks at the elven woman, who waves her hand. The party are released from the hold person. Sorcerer growls. He yells out as a knight strikes him in the back with the flat of his sword. Paladin, my friend that you're abusing is the dragon. We're on a time wary mission right now so we'd greatly appreciate it if you were to let us go on our way. The lead knight shakes his head. Not going to be that simple. He killed several of our men. The sorcerer snaps his teeth at a knight who gets a bit too close. Stupid fleshy shot me. The knight looks at him and shrugs. You were a dragon flying over a heavily populated city. Dug and snickers. So you f king shoot it? You're asking for trouble. The knight gets on one knee and inspects Dargan. Where are you off to dwarf? Seen a lot of your people going home recently. Care to enlighten me what that's all about? Dargan shrugs. None of your business, that's what. The paladin shrugs. He's helping us save our friend. He gestures to the rogue's wrapped up body. One of the knights unwraps the head a bit and looks inside. Oh Jesus Christ. Sorcerer. Blue fleshy hit him. Becoming red fleshy. Help save. The elf woman looks into the wrapping. You realize he's dead right? Kind of beyond saving. The paladin shakes his head. We're going to take him to the dwarfs so they can heal him. We're not sure if what we have can fix him. The elf woman narrows her eyes and then whispers into the knight's ear. He looks at her and raises an eyebrow. He turns back to the group. You'll be coming with us. The paladin shakes his head. Can't do that. We're a bit time sensitive. The man shakes his head. Unfortunately, you don't have a choice in the matter. You're a fugitive and you'll be treated as such. Duggan looks over at the others before turning back to the knight. You know high water was off. Why do this? What can you gain out of it? The knight goes to speak but the elf woman steps forward. A deal. I can save your friend. But I'll need something in return. The paladin frowns. What do you want? The elf shrugs. A few things really. But primarily, information. Sorcerer, information can give. She smiles. It's information that I doubt you would know. She turns to Dargan. You however. She smiles coyly. What's in this area? Dargan spits at her. Go to hell. She shrugs. That's my price. Your friend for the information. The cleric stands there, the all too familiar blade of midnight held to his throat. Tiber gives him a small smile. Afternoon, cleric. Fancy seeing you here. The dwarf slowly stands up beside the cleric. Put down the sword buddy. You're extremely outnumbered here. Tiber shakes his head. Not exactly. He lets out a whistle, and the cleric watches as several robed figures creep out from the nearby grass, moving towards the tents. The cleric growls. What want? Tiber shrugs. A little bit of repayment. I lost everything when you killed Graves. I had to leave Zanimate. Leave my home. All I had was this nice sword here. And you see, I've figured out its secrets. The sword suddenly glows with a black light, necrotic energy swarming over it. The cleric can only watch as several dwarfs are kicked out of their tents, daggers held to their throats. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream echoes into the night, and one of the tents burst open, one of the robed figures sprinting out, holding his hands to his left ear. The fighter steps out behind him, axe in his hands. Using the distraction, the cleric summons the sword, 
knocking Midnight aside before swinging at Tiber's head. Tiber deflects the strike and backs up holding the sword up with a wicked grin. The fighter rushes some of the robed figures, swinging his axe and deadly arcs. One figure is hit in the leg, and when he falls to the ground, the fighter follows up by embedding the axe into his skull. Tiber swings Midnight, opening a cut on the cleric's arm. He smiles and swings at the dwarf, who can barely react before the blade cuts open his stomach. He grunts with pain as the black energy pours from the wound. The fighter dodges an attack and swings his axe, hitting the offender in the arm. However, he doesn't notice a robed figure come up behind him until they jam a dagger into his side. Another grabs his arm and kicks out one of his legs, forcing him to one knee. A third grabs him and jams another dagger into him. The cleric holds up his hand and lets out a long, low whistle. The air suddenly fills with the humming of wings, and the robed figures stabbing the fighter all begin to scream as a swarm of insects begin tearing at their flesh, stinging and biting at any exposed bit of skin. Insects crawl under clothes and into hair and ears. Two of the attackers back up, screaming. The third falls to the ground, screaming horrifically as the insects invade his body. Tiber swings midnight in an overhead strike at the cleric who is only able to deflect the blow into his shoulder instead of his skull. Tiber wrenches the sword out and strikes again, this time raking it across the spiritual sword. The dwarf cleric raises his hand, striking Tiber in the chest with a guiding bolt. The fighter silences the screams of the fallen figure before approaching the others. He trips one with his axe before finishing him off with a deft strike to the chest. He then jumps at the third, sinking his teeth into their throat. The person chokes and screams before their throat is torn out and they collapse to the ground, dead. Suddenly, the fighter yells out as someone grabs him from behind. He's slammed into the dirt and the person scrambles off. He goes to get up but is stopped when a weighted net is thrown over him. Several of the figures run over, repeatedly striking his downed body with clubs. Panting, and bruised, he is barely left with 2 HP. Tiber kicks the cleric in the chest, Sending him to the dirt before he turns around, grabbing the dwarf and holding midnight to his throat. Move an inch and he dies. The cleric, already on his knees, holds up his hand, which begins glowing. Don't try it lizard. I'll kill him before it lands. The dwarf, pale, shakes his head ever so gently. Please him our lizard, I don't want to die. The cleric looks over at the fighter, who is lying, battered and beating on the ground. With a sigh, he lets the sword fade from existence. Let small fleshy go. Tiber nods. That's a good reptile. He gestures to his friends, who walk over and begin to bind the cleric with rope. When he's sufficiently tied up, Tiber tosses the dwarf to the side. He walks up, holding midnight under the cleric's chin. So, where are the rest of your friends? The cleric shrugs. Fly away. Tiber scoffs. Okay. He thinks for a moment before looking at the fighter. Does he know? The cleric shakes his head. We'll say fly too. Sorcerer, become dragon. Tiber nods. Well then. He leans in close. This dwarf intends to betray you. I suggest you rid yourself of him. The cleric rolls a wisdom saving throw. 4. The dwarf's eyes go wide as the cleric draws his dagger and gets to his feet. He holds his hands in front of him, but the cleric wrenches them to the side, brutally stabbing the dwarf in the ribs. He stabs him over and over until the life drains from the dwarf's eyes and he collapses to the ground. Tiber smiles. Good lizard. Now. He points to the fighter. I suggest you heal him. The cleric frowns and walks over, healing the fighter. The fighter frowns at him. What are you doing? Kill the stupid fleshy. The cleric nods subtly before springing into action, stabbing one of the robed figures in the throat. The person collapses to the ground, holding their throat. He whirls around and holds out his hand, launching a guiding bolt. Tiber rolls out of the way and gets up on one knee. He whistles a short, soothing tune which seems to flow through the cleric's ears and numb his very brain. The cleric makes a charisma saving throw. 3. He lowers his hand. Suddenly indifferent to Tiber. Tiber gets up and dusts himself off. Now, now, let's not get too aggressive. 
He looks over at his associate with the stabbed throat, who stares up at him with pleading eyes. Tiber nods his head and the man next to him crouches down and finishes him off. Tiber walks over to the fighter and grabs his head. The fighter tries desperately to bite him, but he deftly keeps his fingers away. He walks behind him, keeping his head in place. One of the dwarfs pinned to the ground begins pleading with Tiber. Let us go. We have no quarrel with you, take them. Tiber looks over. Now where's the fun in that? He tightens his grip on the fighter's head and forces him to look at the cleric. Now then, let's see how far your loyalty stretches. He whispers something into the fighter's ear. Fighter rolls an intelligent save. Nat 1. His eyes become glassy and he slowly draws his dagger, cutting away at the net. He climbs to his feet, staring at the cleric. He lifts his axe and emits a long, deep growl. The cleric summons his sword and growls back. The fighter leaps at him, axe swinging in heavy arcs. The cleric deflects one blow, but is caught in the leg by the other. The fighter sweeps his legs out from underneath him, but the cleric gets up before he can attack, swinging his sword at the fighter's arm. The fighter deflects the strike easily, and the cleric raises his hand, launching a guiding bolt at Tiber. Tiber sidesteps it and laughs. The fighter slams the axe into his other shoulder, wrenching it out and slamming it into his side. The cleric lets out a yell of pain and slams the sword into the fighter's chest, piercing it but not deeply. The fighter rolls his intelligence save. 13. His eyes briefly flicker before returning to their glassy state. The cleric, taking the opportunity, shoves the fighter, sending him to the dirt. He runs around him and sprints at Tiber. He swings the sword and Tiber avoids it easily. Tiber shoves him back, and he turns in time to barely deflect the fighter's strike. The fighter grabs the sword, ignoring the pain and wrenches it to the side. He leans forward and bites into the cleric's neck. The cleric hisses and grabs his bone dagger, ramming it into the fighter's torso. The fighter rolls an intelligent save. 8. The dice are not with them today. The cleric drops his sword, letting it float in the air as he ducks down and stabs the fighter in the leg, moving off to his side in the same movement. The fighter growls and lets out a hiss of pain. He rolls an intelligent save. 16. His eyes clear and he stands there, confused. A round of sarcastic claps echo from behind them, and they see Tiber, standing there mockingly. You really are a pack of savages, aren't you? The cleric looks at the fighter, who, with a yelp of pain, rips the dagger out of his thigh. Let's kill this stupid fleshy. The cleric nods. He grabs his sword and glares at Tiber. Tiber smiles and extends his arms. Shall we dance? No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. The party has split themselves in order to get the rogue help as fast as possible. The sorcerer, paladin and a dwarf named Dargan all began traveling to Gugaria, the sorcerer carrying them in the form of a young red dragon. As they passed over a city, they were shot out of the air and restrained by the city guard. Meanwhile, the cleric and fighter, while traveling to Gugaria by ground, were engaged by Tiber, the half-orc bard who had betrayed them. The paladin turns to Dargan. Please. Dargan looks at him. I will not betray my people. The sorcerer growls. Small fleshy tell pointy fleshy what in this area. Save Gobby. Dargan turns to the elf. I've barely known these men. They've saved my life and in doing so, lost a friend. To punish them for my loyalty to my people would be cruel and morally unjust. The elf looks at him and shrugs. Can you live with it? 
You have the power to save their friend and you decided to keep your secrets. Duggan narrows his eyes at her. They have an intense stare off. Finally, he sighs and his eyes drop. Desaria is a forge. The elf kneels down. I'm aware. Why did it explode? Likely because someone activated without taking the precautions. The forge can be lit by anyone, however, to activate its full functions requires the five keys. Four of the keys are kept in their respective clan strongholds. The fifth is hidden away. The elf stands up and thinks for a moment. Why would someone activate the forge? Duggan stays silent. She sighs. You've told us as much, you've already betrayed your people. Duggan goes to open his mouth but the paladin speaks instead. He won't tell you any more until you are sure that our friend will be saved. The elf turns to him, a coy smile on her lips. You're quite antsy about that aren't you? Why would you save a goblin? Sorcerer, he lizard folk. He one of us. She looks at him and her smile fades ever so slightly. I can assure you, if your friend tells me what I want to know, I'll bring the goblin back. She turns to Dargan. Why would someone activate the forge? What's inside it that's so important? Dargan looks up at her. The forge god. Tybur extends his arms, midnight gleaming in the moonlight. Shall we dance? The cleric, holding his sword, emits a long, low growl. He casts cure wounds on himself, throwing the sword with his other hand. The blade swings at Tiber, whose eyes widen at the movement. He tries to deflect it, but is too slow, and a cut opens on his side. The fighter runs in, swinging his axe in wide arcs. Tiber deflects one strike but yells out as the second hits his thigh. He swings midnight at the fighter's chest, who jumps back just in time to barely avoid the slash. The second swing catches him off guard and opens up his leg. The cleric runs in, dagger in hand. The dagger glows with necrotic energy and he slams it into Tiber's chest. Tiber grunts as the necrotic energy hits him, and turns around to face the cleric, who is now behind him. The fighter, taking advantage of the open hit, slams his axe into Tiber's exposed back. Tiber whirls around and the cleric grabs his sword, opening the wound in Tiber's back further. The fighter, not giving Tiber a moment to react, hits him again in the chest. They're basically ping-ponging him at this point and getting advantage with almost every attack. Tiber raises midnight and the blade emits a larger black glow before suddenly, everything goes dark. The cleric swings the sword, finding nothing. He hears a low laugh beside him and swings in that direction, also feeling nothing. The fighter holds up his axe in a defensive pose and slowly backs up. He hits the cleric and uses his tail to quickly confirm his identity. Why can't see? Stupid fleshy take eyes. Suddenly, the fighter yells out as midnight is raked across his leg. He goes to defend, but with no idea where the next attack will come from, he can't avoid the strike that hits him in the side. The fighter, ignoring the pain, places his hand on the blade and jumps forward, using it to guide him towards Tiber. He grapples him and sinks his teeth into the half-orc, no clue where he's hitting. The cleric casts daylight, dissipating the darkness. Tiber breaks the fighter's grip and swings midnight. Nat 20. The fighter goes to block the strike, but having taken so much damage, the shaft of his axe isn't strong enough to stop the bleed, and it carves through it like butter, following through to embed itself in his shoulder. Tiber, grinning in victory. Yanks the sword out before jamming it into the fighter's chest. The fighter's knees collapse from underneath him. He grabs Tiber's arm, but it lacks any strength behind it. Tiber forces the blade deeper and the fighter gives a grunt of pain as his axe drops from numb hands. His head falls. The cleric, looking on, lifts his sword, letting out a long growl. Die for that fleshy. The cleric throws a spiritual weapon, which Tiber barely deflects. The cleric runs in, grappling him and keeping Midnight locked in place. The two men strain against each other, teeth bared and muscles bulging. Tiber headbutts the cleric, causing blood to flow from his nostrils. He then tries to break the grapple, but the cleric's grip is too strong. The cleric pulls Midnight out of Tiber's hands. As Tiber tries to grab him, the cleric points to a point behind him. A vine shoots from the earth, 
wrapping around the half-orc's waist. He lets out a yelp as he's yanked 20 feet back. He draws a dagger, cutting the vine off of him and rushes at the cleric, who sidesteps the frantic swing. The cleric raises his hands. Die fleshy. The humming of hundreds of wings echoes around him, and Tiber lets out a scream as insects swarm his body, biting and stinging him. He writhes around, trying desperately to fight off the tiny attackers. The cleric walks over, grabbing the spiritual weapon out of the air as he passes. Tiber, still screaming, doesn't even notice him until the cleric buries the sword in his skull, killing him instantly. He hears a series of clangs behind him, and turns to find the dwarfs fighting back the other figures, killing any they can reach. The survivors flee into the night, leaving the bodies of their allies behind. The cleric walks over to the still body of the fighter, pulling a diamond out of his bag. With his final third level slot, he casts Revivify. The fighter sucks in a breath and sits up. What happened? The cleric holds out Midnight. Got your sword back. The fighter takes it, looking at its black bleed, now seemingly devoid of necrotic energy. He smirks. Stupid fleshy. The elf woman raises an eyebrow. The forged god? Duggan nods. The dwarfs built the Desaria forge to create weapons and armor of legendary status. They started building something. Something they'd never done before. The forged god. A construct as tall as a mountain. After it was completed, four of the five tribes realized just what they'd made. A being that could take over Isopin. They elected to never activate it, for they did not want to destroy it. The fifth tribe disagreed, and so a civil war broke out. The deep tribe were driven into the underdark, their key taken from them. The paladin looks over. You made a sentient doomsday device. Why would you think that'd be a good idea? Duggan shakes his head. It's not sentient. It has a crystal engraved with hundreds of sigils in its head, connected to a crown holding a much smaller crystal. The wearer of the crown controls the forged god. The sorcerer shakes his head. Small fleshy stupid. Make big metal fleshy. Decide no like big metal fleshy. Make own threat. Fleshy stupid. Dug and size. I won't defend what we did. But if Desaria has been reactivated, it means someone is trying to control the forged god. They won't be able to activate it without the keys though. The sorcerer nods. Is fine then. Make sure small fleshy protect key. We'll be safe. He turns to the elf. Fix friend. She looks at him and turns to face the body. I can try, but they might not want to come back, and if they do, they won't be the same. The paladin frowns. What do you mean not the same? The elf shrugs. I can reincarnate him, so it's very likely he won't return in the same body. This will mean the disease won't follow him, but the change may affect him mentally. The knight finally speaks up. Why should we? They're fugitives and they killed my men. The elf turns to him. Your men also shot first, and they had no intention to engage. We have what we want. The knight purses his lips but shuts up. The elf turns to the paladin. Do you want your friend back, even if it means losing what you may recognize him as? Sorcerer, will save him? The elf nods. He turns to the paladin. The paladin nods. Do it. After nine days of travel, the cleric and fighter arrive at the city of Tiro, having been told of the events that had transpired through sending. After entering the city walls, they follow directions through the streets until they arrive at a tavern. The paladin waves them over to a table, where the sorcerer is currently chewing into a steak. Beside them is a person in a cloak, unmoving. The two sit down, looking at the cloaked figure. The fighter looks at the cloak and points to it. Who knew fleshy? The paladin winces. There were some UHH difficulties that we didn't tell you about. The cleric frowns. Where? Rogue. The paladin goes quiet. Suddenly, the cloaked figure moves. I'm here. The cleric looks at him, and gently reaches for the cloak. They take off the hood, revealing the rogue underneath. Dark skin, pointed ears, narrow eyes. He's a drow. The fighter pokes him. Why no goblin? The paladin picks at the table with his claws. 
the elf spillcaster who brought him back could only do it by making him a new body. It was the only way to make sure the curse didn't come back with him. The rogue places his head on the table and holds his hands over his head. She mutilated me. The sorcerer shakes his head, unaware that the rogue can't see him. Save you. Give you life. The rogue shakes his head. I should have stayed with Corley. I should have said no. The paladin nudges the cleric and passes him something under the table. The cleric puts his hand on the rogue's arm and gently pulls it away. The rogue lifts his head, looking at him with tears in his eyes. The cleric passes him the bone dagger, carved with draconic words. Still friend we knew. You still lizard folk. The rogue takes the dagger tentatively and looks at it. He slots it into a sheath and nods, wiping away his tears. Promise me one thing. The cleric nods. Yes. The rogue pauses. If I die again. Don't bring me back. The cleric nods again and the table goes quiet. Game ends. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.